So, I tried to clean it up a little bit, Rita, just for you, okay? But let me walk through it. So here's what has happened. As, as time has progressed, okay, you go through Ezekiel's prophecy. Now, you come to the 11th year, which is 586 B.C., and you get the fifth division of Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 26 through 28, okay? But then all of a sudden, when we get to chapter 29, he actually speaks about things that were previous to that moment in time, okay? So then you get the sixth division after the fifth division, but it's back in time. Then we go forward in chapter 29, and then he talks about the seventh division of, of his prophecy, which happens way out here in the 27th year of captivity. And then we go back when we get to chapter 30, and we get division 8, which is the 11th year of captivity, which in time, I believe, is just before this part of the 11th year. Okay. Anyway, that's a different topic. So I just want you all to see the gymnastics. We go from Division 5 to Division 6, Division 7, Division 8. That's really how I should draw it. I should start right here and I should draw a loop and then a loop and then a loop and then continue on because that's kind of how we experience it as we're reading straight through the book of Ezekiel. Okay, That's a little bit of a clue why I believe the sequence gets out of order. Now, let me just say this. I believe it was an editorial decision on Ezekiel's part to put things out of sequence. And the reason why you have it in the order you have it in your Bible was an editorial decision on Ezekiel's part to serve the narrative better to make the narrative clear. Let me explain that. If you took out the, the dates in Ezekiel's prophecy, you know, in the 11th year and the 10th month and all that stuff, if you took those verses out of it and you just read the text, the narrative is smooth in the order that it is in your Bible. Okay? And I believe that is the reason why Ezekiel chose to put things out of sequence is because it keeps things consistent and in context. Otherwise, here's what would happen. If he waited to share this information in the second half of chapter 29 when he gets out here with the other portions of his prophecy, this is going to stick out like a sore thumb. It's going to be out of place because once you get out here in this portion of Ezekiel's prophecy, we start talking about the hope of Israel and the future kingdom and the coming king and Israel's restoration. And then all of a sudden you're going to talk about destroying Pharaoh? It's out of place. So by doing this, by pushing it back into this portion of his prophecy, he keeps all of that information consolidated and consistent, and it serves the narrative better. better because we're in this whole section from uh, chapter 26 all the way up through 32. It's this whole section where God is pronouncing judgment, and he's speaking specifically about these surrounding peoples, not Israel in particular. But once we get past this section, then he's just addressing Israel as a people. Okay? And so I believe that's the reason why you get this funny gymnastics there. Again, that's commentary. You can argue with it. I don't care. Okay? But then you've also got to tell me what you think. So go, Rita. One, nine, five, eight. <laughs> Explain it to you. Oh, no, that's a cop out. <laughs> it's complicated. It is complicated. That's just my best stab at it. That's my best guess at it. I, I think it is just to service the narrative. Now, that being said, I do believe it is Ezekiel that is the one that is compiling this prophecy the way you get it here. Now, you have to also understand the process of the way the oral tradition became written tradition. Now, initially, when Ezekiel would receive the words from God, it was just spoken to him. Now this requires faith on your part. How in the world is he going to remember all that stuff so that it can be written down accurately? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. That is a part of God's powerful ministry through the Holy Spirit 
part, particularly to the Jews. Because remember what Romans chapter 3 says, that uh, unto the Jews were the oracles of God committed. So it is a special part of God's program through the nation Israel to disseminate His Word. And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, He even told the disciples over there in the Gospels, He said, listen, when the tribulation time comes, don't worry about what you're going to say and all that stuff. I'll bring to your remembrance those things that you need to, to know. And that's what He does through His Spirit. That is not something that is given to us today. This is a special ministry of the Holy Spirit through the gifting that He has given these prophets of old, not to us, average, ordinary members of the body of Christ. Okay, that is not a part of our program. And we don't need it. Why? We, we've already got it. It's in completed form. It's finished. To use the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that which is perfect has come. Okay. Why do you think the significance? Uh, wait, wait, say again. I, I missed you there. What now? What would be the significance mm -hmm. of each, each one of these where he is specifically given a date, a month, a year, tying down yeah. to the date? Yeah, I think some of that is just for our benefit, to be quite honest with you. Here, age is on down the line. Because what it can do for us is it helps us to have a sense of confidence in the validity of it. Okay? I, I trust it anyway, but it sure is a relieving thing when I can even go to the history books and the history books show similarity and they, they, it's parallel. Also be those to kind of drive home the amount of time they suffered. Yes. Yeah. And, and, all, the, and on all the events that were rolled into that. So... There's a lot of reasons for that, to be quite honest with you. Um, probably don't have enough time to get into all of them. But I do think it, it is for the sake of our comfort in the Scriptures, to be honest with you. We can take comfort knowing that it's, it's valid. And so anyway, so it gets tricky, and I think that's the reason why. I think it's just to service the narrative here. Um, and you got to remember, the book of Ezekiel, the whole point of the book of Ezekiel wasn't to give the Jews a, their, a history lesson of their, their history and a chronicle necessarily, a chronological order of their history. I don't believe that's the intent of God's Word through the prophet Ezekiel to His people. I think the greater issue at play is what God is saying and the judgments He's pronouncing, the reasoning for those judgments, um, how they're going to come about and all those things, the actual content, not the dates. It's not so much that we have the, the particular chronology, although it works out, I think the greater point here is, is the narrative that's being pushed here in, in the sense of what God is doing through history. Another thing this does for us studying this. Here we are in chapter 29, okay? Ezekiel receives the, the information in chapter 29 out in the 27th year of captivity. Okay. Now what you're going to see here in a minute is that, what is it, 17 years before, Ezekiel receives this grouping of revelations where he's predicting this. So what's cool is in one chapter of your Bible, you have a 17 year span where something is predicted and it comes true. You tell me, what book on planet Earth does that? <laughs> That's the only one. <laughs> Look, I mean, it's incredible. Now, what does that kind of stuff tell us about the character and the nature of God Himself? What does that teach us? It's some sticky issues, I can tell you that. But something seems to be clear to me. God can see... Right? I mean, this information is in the 27th year of captivity. The information spoken back here is in the 10th year of captivity. There's 17 years of difference. And, you know, it all comes to fruition just the way it was spoken. And so, uh, I, I think that's pretty incredible. Um, I hope that's clear. It, it, this stuff, it gets complicated when you start thinking about these dates and the back and forth and the twists and turns of it. Um, all right. Also, it says in the tenth year, in the tenth month, twelfth day. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, that's when it was received. Yes. That's when the message was received. Yes. Not when it actually happened. That's correct. Yes. So here's what happens. For example, um, where is it? I'll get to it in a minute. And it may be this, it may be the Division 7 uh, in the 27th year. He talks about some of these things that were prophesied coming to fruition, but it's still about a five year period of time before it actually comes to a head. So, for example, what, what you'll see. Uh, the Babylonians would siege, they would besiege the siege. They'd surround it and control it and all stuff. Just the setting up of the siege would be a year or more. Then the actual taking down of the city may have been initiated at the end of 586 BC, but it wasn't complete for a couple years. So you get those kinds of issues as well going on. And so. Um, so you're right. There, but, and we always have to remember that when you're doing Bible study, just because you read it in an instant doesn't mean it happened in an instant. Um, you've got to think about in, in these you know, 30 chapters that we've covered so far in the book of Ezekiel, how much history has transpired here. We can read all of that in about an hour of time. Well, it took more than an hour to actually happen. Okay, And so you have to kind of be disciplined in your reading and in your studying of the Scripture to remember, this thing kind of stretches out. You have to kind of unfold it, you know. And so uh, that's what's going on there. All right, come back to Ezekiel chapter 29. Ezekiel chapter 29, and let's just start in verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me to get the, the context here. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So here we are, We're right here. We've been here, but now Ezekiel is going to come back on the timeline because it's consistent with the narrative of what all he's been talking about, the pronouncement of all these judgments. He's coming back here now, and so we're coming back to the tenth year of captivity. And he says in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So now we've covered all these bad boys over here in this territory, and now God's going to point his finger at Egypt now. So he's coming over here, and he says, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. He's crazy. But I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick uh, unto thy scales, and I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy rivers, and all the fish of thy rivers shall stick unto thy scales. And I will leave thee thrown into the wilderness, thee and all the fish of thy rivers. Thou shalt fall upon the open fields, thou shalt not be brought together nor gathered. I have given thee for meat to the beasts of the field and to the fowls of the heaven. And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of thee by thy hand, thou didst break and rend all their shoulder. And when they leaned upon Upon thee thou breakest and madest all their loins to be at a stand. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon thee, and cut off man and beast out of thee. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he hath said, The river is mine, and I have made it. Behold, therefore, I am against thee, and against thy rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate, from the tower of Syene even unto the border of Ethiopia. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations." and will disperse them through the countries. Yet thus saith the Lord God, At the end of forty years will I gather the Egyptians from the people whither they were scattered, and I will bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, and to the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall be the basest of the kingdoms, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, that they shall no more rule over the nations." And it shall be no more the confidence of the house of Israel, which bringeth their iniquity to remembrance, when they shall look after them. But they shall know that I am the Lord God. Okay? Now, here, here's, again, God is expressing His anger. He's expressing it against the Egyptians. And, and here's the reason for God's angst. And, and you catch it there, especially in verse 16. 
the, the reason for God's anger is because Israel continued to look to other sources for help in their time of need. In this particular situation, here's Babylon. you got Nebuchadnezzar. He has besieged the city. At this point in time, Jerusalem is surrounded. You've got a good portion of the Jews have either been killed off or they've been deported to Babylon. And now the people that are remaining in the land, they are in dire need of some big brother to do some dirty work for them. So who do they turn to? Who are they going to trust? Is it going to be Yahweh? Slave masters. They're slave masters of all people. They turn to Egypt. Okay? And so this is what's making God so mad. Now, hold your place here and go back with me to Isaiah chapter 31. I believe so. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Isaiah chapter 31. This has been an age-old problem with the nation Israel. Now here's what's interesting. You're talking about Ezekiel being a nervous cat at this point. You've got Egypt who has existed for about two millennia at this point. You've got the pyramids. You've got all kinds of engineering marvels and things. These are a powerful group of people on the earth, especially in that day and time. They are revered and feared. Okay, And then you've got little old tiny speck of a group known as these Jews. And you've got God telling Ezekiel, their prophet, I need you to go bow up on them Egyptians. Don't worry. Israel's got your back. Thanks. How's that going to help anybody? You know? Um, and so, uh, but, but notice, it doesn't matter. God says, look, here's what's supposed to happen. Look at verse, uh, chapter 31, Isaiah 31, verse 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. You know, you would have thought in Israel's past, oh, I don't know, somewhere back here when this little old shepherd boy on the back side of the hill, the runt of the litter of the boys, beats up on none other than the mighty giant of the Philistines. You would have thought Israel's history, maybe they would have learned it's not about the size, it's not about their strength or their military might, it's not about any... You would have thought they would have learned that lesson, right? Maybe they would have thought, oh, I don't know, maybe when God brought them out of Egypt and He parted the sea and He crossed them over into Jordan and Joshua's watching all this, you would have thought by, by this point in time, maybe Israel learned a lesson. See, y'all, this is the problem. The human flesh does not improve. This is, to me, one massive evidence for why natural selection is stupid. If natural selection were true, then humanity would be annihilated. Because we would only interact and mate with smart people who don't sin. Which means everyone would die and the human population would cease to exist. Because those people don't exist who are sinless. There are some that think they are, but they don't truly exist. Okay? And so, uh, you would have thought they'd learned a lesson, but no. And God warned them, don't go back to... Y'all remember when Israel was uh, led out of Egypt? You know, they got out in the wilderness, they started getting hungry, and they started whining and moaning, and they wanted to go back to Egypt. Y'all remember that? And God provided manna... And then eventually he provided quail and all this stuff for them because they were whining. I mean, God just kept having mercy. He didn't want them to go back here. Why? He, he, it's not just that He wanted them to depend on Him. Lynn just said He wanted them to be free. He wanted them to understand true liberty. You know, this is going to sound like modern preaching. But isn't this really an analogy for denominationalism? We've all been there. It would feel so good to just kind of go back. To have it, you know, before we had to 
rethink all of our doctrine. Had to go through all this chaos, all the change. It wouldn't be, wouldn't we have been, no, can't do it, can we? Can't, <laughs> I ain't going back. <laughs> We're only going forward whew, that way, right? And so, uh, but that's what happens. That's what kind of human nature does a lot of times. We want to go back to safety and security, and the reality is it's not secure, it's not safe. God was trying to lead them to liberty and to, to safety, but they just they weren't going to have it. And so, see, the, the reality is, is, is God's will and His plan for Israel was to be this completely separate nation. Completely independent nation, solely dependent on Him and Him alone, so that the world would know that He alone is the one true God. And the reason why he picked little old bitty Israel is because they were little old bitty. He wants the world to see that the stuff that you put your hands on is not sufficient. It will not cut it. He wants us to be dependent on him and him alone. Now, here's the thing. And this is kind of an interesting dynamic. Not only was Israel not turning to God, they were turning to Egypt, but they were turning to Pharaoh that thought of... Think about the slap in the face of God that this is. God's people were not turning to Him. They were turning to a guy that thought he himself was God and he himself created the Nile River. You're not hearing me wrong. Literally, he thought... He created the Nile River. You can read it right here on the pages of your Bible. Uh, look with me at verse 3, chapter 29, verse 3. Uh, in Ezekiel, sorry, not Isaiah. Ezekiel, chapter 29, verse 3. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. That's the guy that God's special people are turning to for help. There are so many parallels to modern politics right now that I'm going to resist. Okay? Just hear me. Turn to the Lord, please. Turn, trust in God. <laughs> please trust in God. But, you know, again, Israel just kept going back. It just kept drawing from that well. And, uh, and when they did, here's, what, here's the problem. Now, here's what, not only did it anger God because they were turned into a, a nutcase, this psychopath, this egotistical maniac, but watch this. When they did, in their moment of weakness, in their moment of vulnerability, how did nutcase over here treat them? Well, look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. When they took hold of thee by thy hand, he's speaking to Pharaoh there, thou didst break and rend all their shoulders. In other words, he put the yoke on them and it was so heavy. They were in such slave, in such bondage to, to Egypt and to the Pharaoh that he just crushed them. He had no mercy in their time of need. Instead, he just broke their backs. It says, he goes on, um, And when they leaned upon thee, thou breakest and madest all their loins to be at a stand. So he had zero mercy. And so now God says, It's coming to you, Egypt. It's coming to you, Pharaoh. You had no mercy. I will have no mercy. I love my children. No, they shouldn't have come to you, but you sure shouldn't have treated them like that. He's mad. God's mad. And he didn't, you know, Egypt's now hurt his babies. And so, now, let's look a little bit closer here at the narrative, at the chronology here. Come with me to verse 10. Uh, and Ezekiel says, Behold, therefore, I am against thee and against thy rivers. He's talking about Pharaoh there. And I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from the tower of Sain even unto the border of Ethiopia. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast uh, shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. Um, now, 
The question is about this 40 years. When does the 40 years start and when does the 40 years end for Egypt's punishment? Now, this is what's interesting. So, you're in chapter 29. This is... This, the next section of verses gives the answer to that. So this is part of the reason why I think Ezekiel puts things out of chronological sequence and jumps ahead to year 27. Because back here in the 10th year, he's saying, look, Egypt, you're going to have a 40-year period of desolation and it's just going to be nasty for you. And then all of a sudden we jump to the second half of chapter 29 and guess what he's going to talk about? This is at hand now. Your desolation is at hand. So let's come to verse 17. And he says this, uh, And it came to pass in the 7 and 20th year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... And what does he say? He says, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadrezzar, uh, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord God. And that day will I cause the horn of the house, or the strength of the house of Israel, to bud forth, and I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So here's what's going on. This 40 years, Ezekiel fast forward to the 27th year in chapter 29 here because he wants to demonstrate this whole situation coming to fruition, the punishment of Egypt and the start of the 40 years. Now the start of the 40 years is when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and this time he's wiping out Egypt. And he's not just wiping out Egypt, he's getting that whole territory, Libya, Ethiopia and all that stuff. Now... There's a double fulfillment situation here because it also happens with the Persians. And then as you get further on down the line, they continue to go into this desolation. There's a grammar aspect here as well where there's an ongoing action. It's not just like a definite boom and then it's an ongoing 40-year period of desolation. Okay, So it's not like overnight all of a sudden they were uninhabited and it sat there blank for 40 years. It was an ongoing thing. Does that make sense? Hopefully got to that question there. And so, um, so that's what's going on here. So as it turns out, that 40 years of desolation and dispersion of the Egyptians starts with Nebuchadnezzar's campaign against them. And it's in order... Here's what happened. When the Babylonians come in, they start wiping out this area and are, are taking over the whole area. When they go to Tyrus, God sends them to Tyrus. This is, according to the history books, this is about a 15-year campaign that Nebuchadnezzar levels against Tyre up here. Okay? Over the course of that 15 years, even though this was a very wealthy place and all the trade routes came in and out of here, it got to the point over a decade and a half where uh, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't pay his troops because there wasn't enough spoil entire to pay his troops. That was their incentive for being soldiers. Wherever they went and destroyed stuff, they could keep all the, the spoils of war. Well, they ran out. So then Nebuchadnezzar's looking for a way to pay his troops. So you know what he does? He gets the bright idea. You know who is wealthy? Bing! So he sends his troop and he just, just goes right through there and he comes to Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, this whole northern region of the African continent there. And now he's going to be able to pay his troops. This is interesting to me because this is the sort of human and historical side of the prophetic scriptures You've got a man, Nebuchadnezzar. He's got real responsibilities to his troops, to his country. And it is purely for his own political gain, his own power, and his own payroll to his troops that he decides to go down here. And guess what? Way before it happened, God said, Egypt, I'm sending the Babylonians to you. In real time, in real human history, though, what are the motivators to send Nebuchadnezzar there? Was it God going, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm pushing you there? All it was was a matter of God 
seeing this man Nebuchadnezzar, understanding that he would have these needs to pay his troops, understood that he had this this covetous desire to have power and to control the known world and that that would motivate him to go to Egypt. God saw that. This is what I find so interesting about the Scriptures is this, this network of information that all comes together and how cohesive it is. Leif, you had a question. I thought it was interesting too that this is 17 years later. Yep. Took him about 15 years to take out Tyre. Yep. All works, doesn't it? Yeah. That's a very convenient span. That's right. You, you got, what is, where's my 15 years start? Somewhere back in here, 585 ish, right about here. You know, 15 years uh, for Tyre to be, to, to be destroyed. And so, yeah, it all worked. The history works. The timeline works when you see that. Um, and so, again, I, this, is, this kind of helps support this notion of why things get out of sequence is because we want. God wants the narrative of the destruction of Egypt to flow. And He also wants to bring all of that information to a close because when you get to chapter 32, I believe it is, chapter 33 and on, then we start coming back to dealing specifically and solely with the nation Israel. All the bad guys, the bad players are out of the way. Now, Israel, let's look at you. Let's get you back on track, Israel. Because I've still got a plan for you, still got hope for you, and it's something for you to look forward to. But we, we, he had to get through these pronouncements of judgments and all that information. So I think, again, that's why uh, you get the, the sequencing out of order there. But uh, go back with me to Isaiah chapter 46. Must have left a lot of gold in <laughs> yeah. According to the History Channel, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, people people always go mine for gold, like in Alaska and British Columbia and places like that. Why not go to Egypt? Apparently, there's something in the dirt over there. I don't know. Um, all right. I'm going to ask a sticky question. Okay. I, I, I mean this in sincerity. I, I mean this just in the sense of exploring the Bible. Seeing this shake up in the sequence and all that stuff and how it's placed into the Word. and You get it prophesied back here. You get some fulfillment out here and it goes back and forth. And just seeing God is giving all this information along the way. Do you think God does have foreknowledge? Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Go with me to Psalm 147. Now, I, I know this is a st sticky topic, but one thing that seems to come to bear quite often in the Scriptures is the very nature of the foretelling of prophecy rests on the idea of knowing something before it happens. And so, you know, there's only one that I know is able to do that. And so I've got to try to figure out how this stuff comes together. Psalm 147 verse 5. Great is our Lord and of great power His understanding. The word infinite, infinite. Finite is definite, infinite is not definite. So His understanding is without bounds. That includes uh, the bounds of what we call time, however you want to define it, however you want to think about it and all that stuff. God is not limited. Now, it's up for debate. I get it. Does God want to limit Himself at times? Maybe. Maybe. Okay? 
But what I cannot deny, what I can't get around, I can't, maybe y'all can't, I can't get around the notion that God does see ahead. What we consider to be ahead in time. For Him, there's, it, it is no time. He's, he's infinite. That's hard, that's complicated, that's philosophical stuff. But just something that I can't help but bring up because I encounter it over and over again here. Now, this is what I do not think happens. I want to be clear about this. And, and there are distinctions to be made. And this is a good example, I guess. But just because God back here says this is going to happen, okay, doesn't mean, for example, that He's forcing Nebuchadnezzar into Egypt. I mean, you read it from the pages of Scripture yourselves. Why did Nebuchadnezzar go down to Egypt? Was he subservient to God? No. Doesn't even believe in him. Doesn't care a thing about him. Okay? He just had his own desires. God saw it. And saw this would be the outcome of that. Okay? Uh, I think that's incredible. I think that speaks volumes of our God whose understanding is infinite who knows the end from the beginning and can tell it. You know, I, I think these are all incredible thoughts, something for you to grapple with, something for you to... to because I understand why that's difficult. I understand. If he sees it ahead, does that mean it has to happen? Okay? Um, is he controlling it by his just knowing it? Those are the questions that start to come up. And that's, that's questions that you need to, you need to consider. Okay? You need to iron out for yourself. You need to be persuaded in your own mind. And you're welcome to do so. Um, my only request is that when you do grapple with those questions, and everybody tends to grapple with these kind of questions, you need to do so the best you can from your understanding of the Scripture rightly divided. Okay, Very important. Now, chapter 30. So, we went chapter 29. We spread out over all those years. Now we're coming to chapter 30, so we're coming back even before the time of chapter 26, and we're going to get another division of Scripture here, but it makes sense that he would come back because these two sections right here, okay, continue this narrative of the punishment of all these surrounding neighbors. Now we've got to come back to where we were in the 11th year uh, of the chronology here. And so that's where we come to in chapter 30. And look with... I, there's no way. I thought I, thought I had time. I don't have time because I have been long-winded. And so we're going to stop here next week. Y'all got to remember all this craziness, this, this timeline gymnastics, because when we come back next week, we're going to jump into chapter 30 and come back to this point on the timeline and then talk about the history moving forward from there. Okay? That's all I got for you. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Well, let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank You for Your Word. And there's still so much, God, for us to learn. And obviously, there's still gaps in our understanding of what's happening, the reasoning behind some of this stuff. And uh, hopefully, Lord, maybe in time we will discover that. But um, for today, Lord, I just want to say thank You that You've made Your Word so complex and yet so simple. Um, it is such an enticing book to study, to pick up, to dig into, to grapple with. It, it, it keeps us coming back for more. And, and every time we do, our relationship with you grows and our, our understanding of you deepens and nothing is more valuable. And so thank you for that, God. I pray, Lord, as we go our separate ways and uh, head off into our family environments, work environments, school environments, all these different places, God, that we will remember the true enemy and what exactly is going on. The same thing that's happened in Ezekiel's day, just the blindness of humanity because the prince of the power of the air, he has been uh, very effective at his job. And um, we know, God, it has not uh, gotten out of control because you're in control ultimately. And so uh, we just pray that you help us to have the boldness to be um, those Navy SEALs on the ground in the midst of, Navy, uh, in the midst of enemy territory, Lord. We thank you that you've given us the truth, simple and plain. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all come back here. You have to because we've got to sort all this out still.